Um, okay, so I'm gonna actually do two, I'm gonna do the normal CS thing and split into two chunks. So the first chunk will be this, um, which is composable planning with attributes. And I wanna make one correction, it is not actually RL. Um, but it is an agent in environment that we're gonna be talking about, so we'll talk about that more. Um, so the basic premise that we're gonna, that is motivating us is, is that, uh, or the, the basic thing that is motivating us is that intelligent agents are hard. So kind of at an ambitious level, think of something like Alexa or you know a personal assistant or something like that, but kind of even much more kind of simply uh, something that would build things out of Lego for you, something like that. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why, why kind of intelligent agents are hard is because there's, uh, you expect it to be able to do a lot of things. You, there's, it's not a single task. There's kind of maybe one environment that the agent lives in. Um, if it's Alexa, it, it lives in your house and has access to the web. If it's, a, um, you know, if, if it's something, you know, something else, it might have some other environment. But maybe it has one environment, but you expect it to be able to do lots of different tasks. And in fact, usually there's too many tasks to train on all of them. Uh, and even communicating what you want the thing to do is hard. Um, and so kind of a natural in 2018 approach, like things, if, if you want to kind of go with the flow and do what people do, is you think, well, um, if you do maybe some reinforcement learning and then you describe your tasks in natural language, maybe you can do something because, you know, language is composable so you can describe a very large number of tasks. The composability of the language might inform how the agent kind of uh, approaches the tasks, and since you have this composability in the language, then you know you can really train to do a lot of things, and a huge tail task, a uh, huge tail of tasks can be represented. But the problem is that uh, language is already hard. Like not even counting any of the reinforcement learning issues, and reinforcement learning is hard, um, and reinforcement learning with a giant task space is especially hard. And so basically, in order to do this thing where you want an agent that can solve lots of different tasks in an environment um, with this kind of, we do reinforcement learning with natural language. It, it's, I mean, I, I would love it if somebody just did this and it worked, but it doesn't seem to be working. Um, so we can't do that. Now, there is kind of, uh, so Jan is here somewhere, and Jan says, well, the answer is um, unsupervised learning. And to some extent, I agree with that. Um, if you had a really good description of the state space of the environment the agent lives in, then, um, very good in, in, in air quotes, if you had a good description of the state space, then lots of tasks would, you know, you, you can describe what you want to do, um, you can map that to the task space easily, and great. Um, the trouble is that you don't, if you, if you just do purely unsupervised learning, you may not know which features of the state are important to the tasks that the user cares about. Um, you know, generically, if you have an agent in an environment, the environment may be complicated and there's lots of things that it can see and understand in the environment that you will never care about. So how do we not drown in irrelevant details? Well, so the approach of this work is going to be, um, we're gonna make some intermediate representation that's not natural language, um, and it is kind of more abstract than the actual state space, but kind of maybe easier to deal with the natural language. And we're going to train the agent to understand this intermediate representation. In particular, we're going to give properties of the states. Um, we're going to train the agent to recognize properties, and then what we're going to do is unsupervised learning. Once we've done that initial bit of supervision, the agent is going to learn how Different property, different property sets in the environment relate to each other. So what are attributes here or properties? Um, well, they're just binary features. We're just gonna, for us, I mean, whenever someone says attributes, you think of things like, uh, well, let's say we have, we wanna do object recognition in images. So you could say we look for bears and we look for cats and we look for fish, and we look for whatever. Um, that's, that's kind of labeling it directly. If you think in properties or attributes, you can say, well, things with fur, things with you know, tails, things that swim, so on and so forth. So if you're a mathematician, this is the axiomatic method versus you know, instead of saying what, is it that, what are the objects of study, you say what are the properties of the objects of study. And in this case, Mathematically, the thing is extremely simple, extremely simple, uh, general. 
properties are binary functions of the state. Um, and in particular, it's incumbent upon the user, in this case, uh, it's incumbent on us to give properties that make sense. And the point of the properties, the point of these binary attributes of state that we're going to give the agent is this is supposed to parameterize the task space. This is supposed to tell the agent what we're interested in. So I'm being very abstract, I'll, I'll kind of be more uh, concrete in a slide or two. Um, so let's give a simple example. Uh, so here is, no, I want to look here. Um, no, not here. Um, here, okay, so here we're stacking blocks. Okay, so here what the agent does is it lives in this world. It's actually a very, it's a toy, but it's kind of a fun toy. Um, so what the agent can do is it can grab a block, and you don't see it grabbing a block. It just, if a block disappears. Um, and then it can drop it somewhere. And we, we want it to be able to stack the blocks in some configuration. Okay, so, so this is the task that I will use as a running example um, for this. Now since we want the agent to be able to uh, since we want to be able to, the agent to be able to stack blocks in all sorts of crazy formations, um, the task space is actually quite large. So here there's four blocks, um, and if you kind of think of all the ways you can stack them, it, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty large. Um, and we, we also have relations like, oh, a red block can be to the left of the green one, there's a blue block in front of the green block, so on and so forth. So we tell it, stack the blocks so it looks like this. In this case, the properties that we're going to give the agent, or the attributes, are all the binary relations between the blocks, right? And it turns out that there's uh, 48. So it could be the, the relations are, the attributes are things like there's a blue block in front of the green block. There's a red block to the left of the green box. Things like this. There's a yellow block on top of the green block. Things like that. So it turns out that there's 48 um, possible ones of these in this particular small example. Um, and so those, those are the properties. And so the point is that if you know all these properties, then describing to the agent what you want to happen, like how do I want the kind of final state to look, is actually pretty easy. But notice that the attributes don't completely determine the state. So here there's a blue block in front of the green block, but it's not exactly right in front of the blue. So there's lots of, for any single set of properties, there's lots of ways that it could occur. Um, okay, so let's go back to this. Okay, so... Um, okay, so what did we say? We're, we're going to we're going to we want to parameterize this task space, and then we want to do unsupervised learning. Um, so how is how is our model going to work? Our model is going to be given some training set of state and attribute pairs, and it's going to learn a mapping from states to attributes. Now, this is the only supervision we're going to give the model at all. We're going to give the model state uh, list of attribute pairs. And then what it does is it explores the environment. Um, it explores the environment using kind of those attributes as, a, as, a, as handholds, in a sense. It goes around, it tries how, how is it that one set of attributes, how is it possible to transfer from one set of attributes to another set of attributes, and so on and so forth. And then at test time, what it's going to do is say, OK, I'm at this initial state. I'm going to say, what are my what are the attributes of that state? Now I'm going to do discrete planning. I've built this big graph of which attributes can be, uh, which, from which attributes can I get to which other trans, uh, attributes. I'm going to do planning over that kind of graph that I've built. And by the way, this is where this fits into this, uh, this, this conference, because what we're going to do is all the planning lives on this graph that we've built. Um, and then it plans where it's going to go and says, OK, so now uh, this is the first step I need to take in that plan. I have some low-level uh, policy that tells me if I want to get to this local goal, then how do I get there? And it takes a step. So let's write that down. Let's write down the model in um, words. So the model is based, it has three parts. The first part is the thing that eats the supervision. This is the attribute detector. So it eats a state, and it outputs attributes. Again, this is trained, supervised. I give it state and attribute pairs. Then we have two other parts. Uh, one part is the graph. The graph says from which, uh, how can I get from this set of attributes to this set of attributes? Is it possible? Now, is it possible depends on this third part, which is the low-level policy. And the low-level policy is, 
says, what do I do, what actions do I take to get from my current state to this set of uh, attributes, which are, in some sense, local. They're close to where I am now. So you have these three parts to the model. And again, the only thing that's trained with supervision is this part. OK, so this part, we train this thing supervised. Um, this is important. This whole thing is kind of, if we have to use a lot of supervision here, it's, it's, it's terrible. But actually, it turns out that, at least in the examples that we're going to use, which admittedly are Tory examples, but they're, they're kind of reasonable Tory examples, it takes very few examples to learn the attribute uh, detector relative to how many steps it would take, for example, for reinforcement learning to solve the same sort of problem. So, um, so neural net based attribute detector is pretty straightforward. I'm not going to write down architectures or anything like that. You input a state, you output a set of attributes, and this is trained supervised. Um, so the next part is this uh, transition function. Again, this is a graph. So row i is how I say a set of attributes. Row j is a different set of attributes. And this says, how probable is it that I can transition from this set of attributes to that set of attributes? Um, so let me give you one example of how you would train this thing. You randomly place the agent in some state. Uh, you figure out its attributes. You take some random action or a short sequence of random actions. You arrive at some new state. And then you update a count. Um, and then you just repeat. So what you're doing is, as you're doing this process, you are doing two things. One, you're tallying up which sets of attributes actually exist in reality, because not all the attribute sets may exist. And the second thing is you're counting up how many times can I get from one set of attributes to the other. Um, that first thing I said about you're actually checking which attribute sets exist in real life is super important. So for example, in that blocks thing that I described before, even though it's a very, very simple thing, there's 48 possible uh, attributes. Um, that's two to the 48 possible, you know, combinations of attributes, but the vast majority of those don't exist. Um, just because you can't have, I don't know, red block on top of green block and green block on top of red block simultaneously, so something like that, right? Um, there's lots of things that are just physically impossible, so they don't exist, and it turns out for that particular example, out of the two to the 48, only about 200,000 actually occur. Um, so it's super important to just, you're only gonna build a graph on the things that actually happen, which is important. Um, so here I said place the agent, you know, when you're doing this thing, you place the agent in some random state and then you take some random actions. Okay, that's, that's unfair in lots of ways. First of all, um, in a realistic setting, you may not be able to place an agent in a random state. You, you, may, it just, you, you can't do it. The state is what the world is. Um, and the second thing is it may be super inefficient. So actually what we do, uh, what we actually do is something better. We use the attributes for exploration. So there's a whole you know, kind of literature on exploration in RL and exploration in ag for agents in an environment and so on and so forth. Um, when you have things that you can count, when you have discrete states, people actually understand what to do. We, because we've had, we've kind of discretized this part of the environment, even if the original states were continuous or complicated, we have things we can count. So we can use kind of, the, you know, there's a literature on count-based exploration, we can use that. Um, so we don't have to place the state agent in a random state. We don't have to cheat. And we can do a more efficient thing. We can actually say, if you have not visited this particular set of attributes, you really should try and get there. Um, OK, so I said something about the transition function. I said how we build this. There, there's kind of a lie that was hidden there, which we'll get to in a second. But let me say one last, let me say something about this guy first. So the third part of the model was the thing that actually decides how to act. And again, that thing that decides how to act, what it assumes is that you're, it's going to be in some state, that's this thing here, and it's going to have some target set of attributes that it wants to get to. Now, this target set of attributes is meant to be close. It's not meant to be, uh, it shouldn't be something very far away. Um, so this thing, we're going to train it. Again, it's a neural network, and its job is to solve simple things, things that are close. Um, and there's, again, there's lots of ways to train it. Um, I said we're not going to do RL, that's true at the high level. Um, this is, we can, we can kind of do all sorts of things here. But notice there's no supervision uh, from the environment when we're doing these things. The agent is learning by itself based on its own uh, transition thing, how to do 
um, these local actions. The environment doesn't tell it anything. We're done supervising once we gave the state attribute pairs. Now the agent is just wandering around saying, oh, let me try to get to this particular attribute set from the one I'm at. I think I can, so I'm going to try. And it decides that itself. We don't, we don't supervise that. Um, so there's a problem, which is uh, different states uh, may belong to the same attribute set, but may have, oh uh, yeah? Yes. Is this supervised or do you generally have the impression that uh, you know any <coughs> of the 48 possible it, Right. So I was super sloppy about that on purpose. Um, so what it does is, I mean, there's several ways of doing it. One is you just do some random exploration at first. And then you say, oh, well, I did some random exploration. Now I'm going to try the ones that I've visited. When I was at this uh, set of attributes, I'm going to visit the ones that I visited. Another thing is you can do as we did the exploration, where it really tries to explore a bit. And then, as a second stage, you do this thing again. Or you can do a third thing where you do that all simultaneously, where you keep a count of what I've seen before. You're rewarded for doing new things. Again, this is intrinsic reward, not extrinsic reward. Um, and as I'm doing this thing, at each time, I try and give myself a goal that's going to give me that. So I, I have an incentive to go to not very visited um, attribute sets. And I get a reward for that. And that's the reward I use in the. Thing. But again, all those are, I mean, I would say those are somewhat technical, detailed choices. And there's a second, th th there's an important thing, which is all of those use internal intrinsic ward. There's no ward given from the environment for those. Um, OK. So there was a problem with everything I said, which is that nothing is well defined. So what I said is we have this mapping from states to attributes, and we're building a graph of, can I get from this set of attributes to this set of attributes? Right? But the problem is that two states might belong to the same attribute, but have different transfer properties. Right? It could be that it's just these two states look the same in terms of the attributes, but it's just missing information. So an example in the blocks that I had before, um, maybe the, the grid, the, sorry, the space of where the blocks can drop is a fixed size arena, and you, know, you're, you, can't, go, you can't drop anything out the edge. So maybe if the block is here, I can drop something to the right of it. But if it's here, I can't drop something to the right of it. right? And the attributes may look the same of those two. So for example, here, I might have a red block and a green block. And here, I might have a red block and green block. And this one, I can drop a block to the right of it, a yellow one. And this one, I can't. So the attributes can't see it. So this is, you know, generally, we call this aliasing um, in this kind of a, a this general idea is aliasing. Aliasing is an actual problem for us. And so we have to be super careful when we're doing the step two, or when we're building this transition function. Uh, we have to deal with aliasing. Um, and the way we do it, the way we do it is we actually go through, we don't do random actions, we actually check with the policy. And again, you can do this everything together. You can do it in two stages. But you actually check with the policy what's the probability. I actually try to give myself tasks and say, what's the probability that I can get from one state to the other? I don't just count like I wrote before. Um, so you still have alias states. But if, if a particular transition is, is super low probability, you know, well, I'm not going to do it. Maybe there's something funny happening there. But OK. so. Now that's all the pieces of the model. Let's recap how we would actually test this thing. How do we actually use it at test time? We're given an initial state. I tell the model what to do. Um, I tell the model what to do by describing the final attributes to it. It makes a plan by doing dextra on the graph. right? So we've built up this, this transition graph that says, how possible is it for me to get from one uh, set of attributes to another? So I gave it a target in terms of attributes. It does dextra on this graph gives it the first sub-goal, and then I push that, um, that sub-goal into the low-level policy, and I take a step, and then repeat. Okay, um, And so again, I want to really emphasize this point, because it's important. We're not doing RL, because the only supervision that we're giving from the, uh, the only supervision is we're giving these state attribute pairs. right? In particular, Let's say my job is to, let's say we're doing this block stacking uh, task. This, to, in order to do the block stacking task, I may have to do 10 steps. I may have to do a bunch of steps 
uh, of you know, picking up a block and moving it over here and dropping it, whatever. It may take lots of steps. But this guy has never seen any reward for doing a 10-step thing. It's never seen a 10-step task before. As far as the model knows, every step, every task is one step. Now, test time is going to plan through the transitions that it's, it's seen, but it's never seen any reward or gotten any supervision for long tasks. Um, so let's see what time is it. OK, let me point out one, a, a couple of, so there, there's a lot of related work here. Um, like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going super fast. And one annoying thing about all these talks is, you know, I, it, I make it sound like everything is done in a vacuum, but of course, everything rests on lots of things. Let me specifically say that what we're doing, this kind of, the graph that it builds can be, once you have that, you're basically in the world of what's called factored um, Markov decision processes. So after you've built the graph, after everything is done, then you can think of it as a RL problem, but it's a very special kind of RL problem where you know a lot about the world you're in. Um, and there's a second set of things that are kind of relevant to this crowd, which is these semi-parametric methods. Um, so basically, th there's a kind of recently been this set of works where I collect lots of states and I keep them in memory as you know discrete states, and I do some sort of uh, I do some sort of tabular RL over them, even though my underlying state space may be very complicated. I just keep some examples around, and in particular, I, I really like uh, Morrow's stuff from way back when, because he was doing all this multi-scale, like all his uh, diffusion geometry stuff, he was doing it in this setting long before that thing was, a, was kind of a popular thing to do. So it's kind of cool. So he was doing this hierarchical um, RL by remembering all the things that you've seen before um, quite a bit back. Um, but OK, so let me just say, so again, I don't expect you to actually care about any of these numbers, really. But what I want to say is that this kind of thing, so let, let's, let's, I just want to say the blocks. So, the, so on, this is on the blocks task, and so the first three things are reinforcement learning things. These are hierarchical reinforcement learning things, and these are various versions of the uh, algorithm that we described. And now, that's, that's what goes on this axis. And what goes on this axis is here is when you get one step, like this is your one step accurate accuracy. This is your accuracy on multi-step tasks. This is your accuracy on a very particular uh, four stack. I think it's like red on top of green, on top of blue, on top of yellow, something like that. And then here, there's something else which I haven't talked about, but nothing in this thing that I said stops me from, even though I've trained with uh, all the state, all the attributes being given, I can just all of a sudden give it, say, well, I want blue to be on top of green, but I don't care about anything else. Like, I can underspecify the target, right? So what I want to point out is that on one-step tasks, reinforcement learning works OK, right? It's, it's not terrible. But as soon as you try and do a multi-step task, it dies. It just can't deal with this. And this notice that the reinforcement learning doesn't, is it, we're cheating because we got the properties and reinforcement learning didn't. But um, they're cheating because they got to see the full tasks and we didn't, right? We never saw a full task. They, they did. Um, and so you have the difference between kind of able to do it for these one-step things. Uh, so one-step things, reinforcement learning can do. But if you do a multi-step, it just dies. It can't do it at all. And like especially the, you know, especially complicated ones, it, it just fails. Um, whereas with something like this, you can do it. Um, same thing. This is continuous block stacking. I won't, I won't keep it. Let's skip this. Same things. So this is, again, it's the same sort of thing where uh, Basically, you can't, uh, it's very hard for reinforcement learning to solve these problems. If you give this kind of, this kind of supervision instead of reward at the end of the task, you can actually solve it. Um, so here is a slightly more realistic, uh, slightly less toy problem. Um, so it's uh, literally like this morning, Sina finished these. I think I was typing them in into the thing, right, as the um, thing. So um, this is on StarCraft, and the goal is to build uh, some object in StarCraft. And so uh, StarCraft is one of these games where you have to fight other people, but in order to fight people, you have to build objects. In order to build objects, you have to get resources. So there's this kind of complicated uh, tree of stuff you have to do to get to here. And um, what we did here is uh, there the attributes are some kind of basic, uh, are some, you know, do I have a barracks? Do I have a, I don't know, missile launcher, whatever the other things are. But 
um, the difference between this easy version and hard version. This, this is a, a tree, this is a kind of a single path. You have to build a bunch of stuff to get to you know, a thing, and the hard version is, well, there's, there's two endpoints. Um, so one thing I think is amazing is this line right here. So um, if you think about, so I, I can't remember how many steps it takes to build uh, the, the final thing, but um, to sign out, how, how many objects do you have to build before you build the final thing in the easy? It, it, but it's many, so not even counting basic actions, right? Just at the high level, how many things do you have to build? And building each thing takes a lot of actions, right? So it's, it's, it's like five or six things. The fact that Reinforce can actually ever see, you know, solve this is, is pretty amazing, right? Because it means that it has to have randomly hit, you know, the right things a few times. That's, that's kind of shocking. Um, but the point is that even in this thing, which doesn't have a, you know, it it's, doesn't really fall into our framework of, oh, you have a really big task space, you can get a pretty big improvement by giving this sort of attributes. And then in this hard version where you really start to have, oh, there's lots of different possible tasks that we could ask the thing to do, then essentially, again, reinforcement just dies. And if you, if you give the extra information, it's possible. If you don't, it's, it's really hard. Um, let's see, what time is it? Um, okay, so. I won't talk too much more about this. What I want to say is that what we started with was this idea that we want to be able to have an agent that can do multiple tasks in a single environment. Um, and there's this problem of, well, just acting, just describing what you want the, the agent to do is really hard. Um, but then there's also this kind of being able to do all the things that you want it to do is really hard. It needs to be composable. And what we saw here is that if you have kind of this intermediate representation that you give it that's composable, then the agent can use that intermediate representation both for kind of you describing what you want the agent to do and the agent can use that for planning. And what you see is just by training on you know, simple tasks, the agent at test time with this, again, this kind of composable um, description is able to solve kind of more, much more complicated tasks at test time that it's never seen before. Um, so where are we going? Actually, we already have done that. Um, the, where are we going with this? So right now, we have this discrete graph. It's an actual graph, and it's every state you've ever seen, every attribute set you've ever seen. Um, in some sense, the interest for this group of, of this thing is this, this, and, and this. Like, we have this giant graph that says, what are the transitions between attributes? We shouldn't have to measure every single edge, right? We should be able to figure out the structure of that graph in a much more efficient way. And I've kind of swept it under the rug, but th the method we're talking about in many ways is, is super simple and efficient and can't possibly scale to actually big problems because the set of attributes would get too big. So we need to parameterize that graph in the same way um, and that's somehow, what, what I've described up to now is a sanity check. I, I think it's a very non-trivial sanity check, but it's a sanity check. And now, kind of the real work of using a kind of parameterized graph and dynamically abstracting the state, not always using all the attributes, but saying, oh, well, I want to go to the subway, so I don't care what the weather is in Cleveland. Um, like, actually understanding that. And again, the way you're going to do this is some sort of parameterized model. And that parameterized model very likely will be some sort of graph net. So that's, okay, that's this part. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna talk about something completely different, um, really completely different. Um, so in some sense, I was inspired to uh, talk about this because of uh, Stefan's talk. But um, so, and, and several people earlier talked about GANs. And so I, I feel like, I feel like th this is a good audience for this. Um, so, um, this is joint work with uh, Piotr Bujanovsky, David Lopez Paz, and Armand Jolan at uh, FAIR. Um, so, everybody has seen, or most of you all have probably seen GANs um, and seen kind of what they can do, and they kind of generate really impressively realistic images. And more than that, you have this kind of nice, oh, the Z space has the, uh, the if, you, if you take two random vectors and you interpolate between them, then you interpolate nicely in the images after you push it through the generator. And you have this kind of, I can add up, you know, if I take man with sunglasses, subtract man and add woman, I end up with woman with sunglasses, right? You have these interesting uh, semantic arithmetic in the, in the Z space. And so, they, they look pretty, I mean, GANs look really impressive. And there is 
seriously something there. But, so let's write down the, 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 the GAN optimization. You have a min over something, a max over something else, and that should scare you, it scares me. Um, whenever you have a subtle point, like it's a pain in the ass, and, and it really is hard to do it. This isn't like, oh, theoretically subtle points are hard. No, this is really, like there have been, I think there were like 300 papers at, uh, at Clear this year on GANs, and I would say 90% of them were on stabilizing this. Like, how do I do this so it doesn't kind of collapse? And ultimately, if you just do it naively, it will diverge. Um, and even if it didn't diverge, it's really hard to tell if you're actually you know, doing it. The way, um, the way people often do it is literally they run 100 jobs and look, oh, d is this one working? Yes, it's generating images. Okay, I'll keep that one. I mean, this, this is the state of the art in 2018. Um, it's hard to measure data coverage. Again, once you have, again, you, you don't have a likelihood measure. You don't have anything like that. Um, that's a problem more generally with, the, with uh, this field, but it's really hard to measure if you've actually successfully in any way you know, hit the target distribution of images. And it's really hard to tell, it's really hard to recognize, did I memorize my images exactly? And the reason for that is L2 is a terrible metric for images, right? If I find, if I generate a really good image and I, then I look for it in my data set, I could have done some really simple perturbations of it and it'll be really far in L2. Um, so it's super hard to recognize if you're actually doing anything and it's super hard to do something. So GANs are really more of an art still than a science. Um, so we want to know why they, you know, why they work. And the first question is, do they actually work? And so, I, I mean, I think, it's, it may sound, I, I don't know, so there's some set of people who are like, who, who are kind of very virulently no, and then there's a much larger set of people that say of course, because look at it, it's awesome. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I'm torn, it really depends on the day of the week. Um, so on images, they're obviously doing something, and I'm going to put a star, because I, I said do they work. So they're doing something, but uh, you know, if, if, you, if you believe, in some sense, GANs are often suggested to be a, uh, a solution to the problem of uncertainty, right? How can I measure uncertainty? And it's pretty clear that GANs, A, can generate amazing images, and B, have these nice semantic properties, so it's not trivial what they're doing at all. Like, it's very not trivial what they're doing at all. But, but, um, the, the coverage problems and the memorization problems make it unclear whether you're actually modeling the uncertainty in a sane way. Um, now, to the extent that they work, they work when they're convolutional networks. There has been essentially no uh, kind of great successes of GANs except in the setting of convolutional networks on images. So maybe there's been something very recently I don't, that, I, that I don't know, but as of, you know, as of archive of two weeks ago, th this was, th there, there isn't really a, oh wow, this is really working on something that wasn't images with comnets. So a natural question people ask is, well, what is it about the GAN protocol that's working? But since I look at this and I say, well, it's only comnets on images that are working, what is it about comnets that, you know, is making this work? And so what we did here is to strip out everything from, you know, kind of GAN training or, or autoencoding or anything, like make it as absolutely simple as possible, but keep the comnet and see what we can do. So the model that we're going to use is the absolute simplest thing that you could possibly imagine. It's not a GAN, it's a completely uh, reconstruction-based object, but it uses comnets. And we wanted to make as simple as possible with comnets. So what we're going to do is we're given n images. We get, uh, we get n d-dimensional vectors, so we get a z for each image. So if you'll recall, again, what you do is you sample a d-dimensional vector and you push it through the generator, and then the discriminator decides if it was a real image or not. So you have this z space, right? Here, we're just going to assign a z vector to each image. And we have our convolutional network that generates the images, uh, given a z vector and some parameters. And we're just going to try and minimize some reconstruction loss. So we pick a reconstruction loss and we try and minimize the loss, okay? Um, so it's really, really, really simple. Um, what it is, what we've written down is an autoencoder with no encoder. Autoencoder means I take an image, I apply some neural network to get Z, then I apply a generator to get an image back, right? And they should match. And this says, well, I'll just give you the Z for free and you optimize it directly and generate an image. It is the simplest possible model you could imagine. Like there's not even an encoder, yes? We're gonna train it, we're gonna backprop. 
So the whole thing is trained. Um, okay, let's imagine that the comnet was not a comnet, but was a linear mapping. Then this would be matrix factorization. You have a Z for each image, and you have a matrix that tells you how to reconstruct that into an image. So if, uh, if G of theta, so G of theta is our generator. If our G of theta was, 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 just a, was just a linear mapping, then what I've described to you is matrix factorization. There is a Z for each image, which I try and optimize, right? Now, in this case, it's not matrix factorization because the right-hand side, the thing making a vector into an image is a comnet instead of a matrix. But so how do I get the Z? I backprop through the Z. I just optimize them so that the loss is as good as possible. Okay? Um, oh, that was even, thanks. That was even the next bullet. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so I said we're gonna use some loss. L2 is a bad choice, um, as usual. Um, we're not gonna use L2, we're gonna be slightly more kind of image aware. What we're gonna do is first transform into the Laplace pyramid. So this is Armand, he's one of the co-authors. This is the Laplace pyramid of Armand. So here is the low pass, here is the you know, next high pass, this is the next high pass, this is the next high pass. Um, this is the final high pass. Um, um, Mickey, what do you notice about this? What? It's okay, you, can, you, you already know. <laughs> it's sparse. No, there's, there's, it's almost all zeros. Like, uh, there, this, is, this is almost all zeros, right? The Laplace, what, what? Zeros are gray. Yeah, so if you take the Laplace pyramid of an image, everything is zero except the edges, right? You have the low pass, the low pass isn't zero, but everything else is, is uh, zero almost everywhere except the edges. There's also something cool with the Laplace pyramid, which is, you know, this pixel here is correlated to this one here, it's correlated to this one here, it's correlated to this one here. So if you change this one, you have to change all of these, right, all the way up the thing, yes? So here J is the scale? J is the, um, J is, let's see, so this gets, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to do this in real time, this gets more aggressive as you get finer. So, yeah, so I, I really, I can't do that live. Um, but the, 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 it's really pushing hard here, and it's really, uh, it's really being gentle here. So this number, the, the, the kind of finer you go, uh, the bigger this number is. Okay. Um, so, okay, so this is the loss we're gonna use. We don't use L2 loss when we reconstruct, we use this. Um, so we have our model, our model is um, you try and reconstruct your image given, you know, you try and reconstruct your image given a Z variable for each X. We're gonna use a slightly non-standard loss, but it's kind of very standard in image processing. Um, and so what are the results? When we train this thing, you get really great results on faces and SVHN and MNIST and kind of all the little data sets as well. The badge, you get really bad results on bedrooms since GANs are mostly about generating faces in bedrooms. This is about 50% success. Um, so um, let me show you what the images look like because when I say they're good, it's really good. Like uh, somehow you get, um, let's see, let's, let's, we'll talk about those last two bullets in a second. Okay, so this picture requires some explanation. So what I said is first we optimize, first we optimize this Z and the G simultaneously, right? So that means we have a Z for every image in our data set. So I can take the principal components of the Z after I'm done. So what this image is, is I've taken an image from my data set, it's the one in the middle. Um, now I'm gonna perturb the Z one way, or I'm gonna perturb the Z the other way. With a, so I take the first eigenvector, uh, sorry, I keep saying eigenvector, I take the first singular vector of Z. Sorry, let me say that again. I have all my Z for all my points. I take, do the singular value decomposition, so I find the principal components. And now what I'm gonna do is perturb the eigenvector of the singular, uh, geez, because, he, because it's written eigenvector, so I keep saying it, singular vector, eigenvector of covariance, whatever. I'm gonna perturb in this direction. Um, I'm gonna either increase it or decrease it. Everything is projected to the sphere, so increasing the first one, uh, the weight on the first one decreases everybody else. But what you can see is two things. One, the uh, reconstruction is great. I mean, this is the reconstruction from the thing, but perturbing it semantically is meaningful, right? So each of these images, is different. Like this one is very different from this one. It's, uh, you know, it's always annoying when you show images on a thing because I can't see what you can see. But um, roughly left to right is more and more feminine. Like this way is more feminine and this one is more masculine, roughly. Um, um, 
I can do this with the other eigenvectors. And again, what you find is that you're actually, you're actually getting kind of semantically meaningful changes in this eigenspace. And every one of them generates images. So if we really wanted to generate images, um, if we really wanted to generate images, we don't have to sample a Z from everything. We can just take a Z and move it a bit. We can take an image and, and perturb it, and we get a pretty new image. And actually, once you get far, these are actually reasonably far in L2, once you get far. Um, but they still um, maintain kind of, they, they still are you know, very good uh, faces, even though you're pushing it far from the original thing. Um, you can do this interpolation business. So now I'm going to actually make a comparison. So the comparison is very unfair to GAN, but I think it's a, it's a warranted unfairness. So what I'm going to do, so because here I have a Z for every image, right? Um, a GAN doesn't have a Z for every image. A GAN can only generate the Z that it was born with, like the, the, what, it was, what it was trained on. So what we're going to do is, at test time, we're going to treat the GAN as the same as our model. So I'm going to give you an image, and this is from the actual data set, and I'm going to backprop in Z to uh, ma try and match that image, which is exactly the same as what we do with our model, right? And what you see, first of all, is, let's see, how, how bad does it look from over there? So what you see is that the GAN can't hit your image. It is missing most of the space. It simply can't hit this image, right? So the, the initial trying to, I want to hit this image, is actually quite bad. So if you do this experiment inside the space that a GAN knows, it's great. If you take a random Z and, take an, and, and out push it through the GAN, pick another random Z and do the interpolation, it works really well. But if you try and hit a face image um, that's not one, generated by the GAN itself, then it can't even hit the first image and the interpolation is actually quite bad. On the other hand, if you do, uh, if you do the model we, we have, actually the interpolation is really good. So we have this nice property of the GAN. You have these nice interpolation properties without any GAN, there's no GAN training, right? It's just reconstruction loss. And you have all these, you'll have all these nice properties. Um, so, let's see. Again, here's generations. So I haven't told you how to generate yet. Yes? Uh, yeah, so um, generative latent optimization. Yeah, that, that one's, that was, uh, okay, anyway. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so here, now we're going to do some generations. I haven't told you how to generate, because I have a Z for everybody in my data set. How do I get a new thing? Well, what we're going to do, we're trying, oh, by the way, uh, one thing I want to say is we're being super disciplined about only using the DCGAN architecture all the way through this. Every comparison here is DCGAN and nothing else. Uh, the same with ours. We use exactly the same generator architecture for our model as for the, uh, the GAN. Right? We, we want to be super careful to say, is, are, are we do, is the training protocol doing something, or is the generator architecture doing something? Um, so now I want to actually generate a new thing. So what we're going to do is just take the Z that we got, we fit a single Gaussian to it, which is a really in insanely crap model. It's a single Gaussian for all these things. And then we're going to sample from it, right? So the, the, way, a, the way a GAN um, generates is a GAN generates by sampling from its uniform spherical, like a, a IID Gaussian. We're going to allow ourselves covariance, but it's still a single Gaussian. And so here is the GAN samples, and here is ours, and we have some monsters, like this one and this one. The GAN has some monsters too, I don't know, like, like this one. Um, but roughly, they're, they're pretty comparable. Um, you can argue one way or the other, but it's not that much worse. And this is with a single Gaussian just on the Z, right? And this is fully generative at this point. Um, so you have the semantic arithmetic. By the way, I really want to point something out. You already have semantic arithmetic in PCA. Um, and people don't often notice or say that. But they, I think they, they, I don't know whether they don't notice or say it. But you already have semantic arithmetic in PCA. So here is take man with sunglasses, remove man, add woman, get woman. So in PCA, the eyes are a little darker. It's not quite sunglasses, but it's already the hint of it is there. And there's some ringing. So if you do that with the, you know, with the glow model, you get, you know, it's, it doesn't really change anything. It just sharpens, really. Um, so again, you have this nice semantic, you know, you can, you can do nonlinear semantics in the, by, by linear things in the, uh, the z-space. Again, this is with no GAN trading protocol. Okay, so everything is great, right? Well, no, not quite. We have, the, the results on the bedrooms are quite bad. So, um, how much time? I have like negative one minute or something? How much? <laughs> what? Okay, so, so the thing that we do doesn't, doesn't work on the bedrooms. And my claim is that there's something learnable here, I think. There's a hypothesis. And so what you see is that 
the model can't, these are uh, interpolations. Um, so, I, this, is, this is bad. I didn't actually show how good, this is a bad slide. So I didn't actually show how good GAN on bedrooms are. GAN on bedrooms make very pretty images. This is doing the interpolation thing that we did before. What, don't look at any of this, just look at the GLOW model. The GLOW model um, is very blocky. It is unable with the DCGAN architecture to accurately hit like all the things it needs to hit. It, the model doesn't have enough capacity to do what we want it to do. The interpolation still makes sense, but the model doesn't have the capacity to do, to actually generate nice images. Um, and if we try and generate, um, the generations, I mean, it's like a Mondrian version of a bedroom. It doesn't, it doesn't actually look nearly as good. Like GAN generations from the bedrooms data set are, are really good, and these frankly are not really good. They're kind of Mondrian. Again, this is with the single Gaussian on the C space. Um, so, if we're being unfriendly to GANs, and it's a hypothesis worth testing, what the claim is, uh, is that, so there's this kind of classical mode dropping thing that people say, oh, GAN drops modes. And the claim is this is a feature, not a bug. This is the reason why the GAN is successful. Um, so, the, the bedrooms is much bigger than the faces, and it's much more multimodal. Um, and so, we have a coverage problem. Our thing is forced because you get, you get a, a loss on every single image you miss. Again, it doesn't care. It can miss 90% you know, of the data set and it won't, it won't, the discriminator can give up on those, right? Um, and in fact, it does. It's well known you drop modes. But the claim is that the mode dropping is the thing that's making it work. However, I, I don't want to be too unfriendly to GANs because the GAN, the, in, in the bedroom case, the GAN drops modes very intelligently. Like, again, it is doing something super, super non-trivial. It, it, it keeps a space because the interpolations work and all that. So it keeps a space where it can actually build a good model. And it's deciding to throw stuff away in a very intelligent way, right? It doesn't just throw stuff away uh, indiscriminately. It throws stuff away in a way that allows it to do something. Um, and so our model can't throw anything away. It has to hit every image. And again, you could see this here. So this is the thing, again, where we take a GAN and we give it, a, you know, we give it some image of the data set, we try and back prop through the, the GAN to get the, the best possible Z, and it fails. It just can't get it. Even our, our model even gets much more detail. But if you generate something from the GAN, it's actually much better. By the way, one thing that I haven't said in either of these two things, but it's super important, kind of as a sanity check, if you take a random Z, push it through the GAN, get an image, and then back prop through the GAN to see do I recover the Z. You don't recover exactly the Z, so you don't get exact recovery, but the forward error is very, 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 very low, right? So here, the forward error was terrible. Um, but if you actually take something which is, that was generated by the GAN, the forward error is minuscule. So the GAN really can reconstruct the things in its space through the optimization. The optimization isn't breaking. It's really, the GAN just can't hit that thing. Um, okay, so. There's lots of stuff to do here. I mean, really lots of stuff to do here. I mean, simplest things are just organizing the DC space. Progressive generation is like, if you really care about generating images, you generate progressively. I don't know if you all saw the NVIDIA paper, but it's really beautiful. And progressive generation is the correct way of actually generating pretty images. Um, and, you know, I think, I think somehow this and this are really fun, interesting problems from here. And I'll stop. Yeah, thank you, Arthur. Thank you.